Welcome to the 8th day of the webinar series on health and diseases, contemporary concepts. I welcome you all on behalf of the organizers, the Ravensa University, Institute of Life Sciences, Indonesia, National Academy of Science, India, and National Academy of Neurosciences, India. <coughs> Today we have with us Professor Narendra Mehra, the former Dean and Head of the Department of Transplant Immunology and Immunogenetics at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He is also the National Chair under the Dr. C. C. Pandit ICMR National Chair at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Professor Mehra is known for his uh, exemplary research in histocompatibility and uh, immunogenetics. Today, he will be speaking to us on post immunity and COVID-19. I request my colleague, Dr. Mubisi Vedamata, to present Professor Mehra to you. Thank you, Madam. We welcome Professor Narinder Mehra again to Ravensha University and this time on a virtual platform. Professor Mehra, who has been speaker of the Ravensha 150 Distinguished Lecture Series, uh, has made significant contributions in defining immune mediators, influencing graft success in organ and bone marrow transplantation, genome diversity of uh, human lymphocyte antigen at the population level, and towards developing major histocompatibility complex based vaccination approaches in infectious diseases. Professor Mehra has won over 100 scientific awards and academic honors, including the coveted SS Bhatnagar Award of the CSIR. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Prize of the ICMR and Fellow of the World Academy of Sciences. His book, The HLA System in Medicine and Biology, received high international acclaim, and he served as chief editor of Frontiers in Immunology, special issue, Clinical Relevance of Antibodies in Solid Organ Transplantation. We welcome Professor Narinder Mehra. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I must thank the Ravensha University and the Vice Chancellor for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. And I chose this particular topic of COVID-19 and host immunity because I thought this is the most important topic that everybody is talking nowadays. And uh, everybody is also talking whether when will this uh, pandemic be over. So I think these are very relevant issues and this is something and now of course eight or nine months down the pandemic a number of papers have come up in the field of immunology of COVID-19 and and we have really learned a lot out of this and I'm going to share some of this knowledge with you. If you look at the pandemics over the centuries, you know, the pandemics is not something new. We have had pandemics right from the sixth century when plague was actually there and the plague also came up again in 14th century, smallpox in 16th century and so on and so forth. The last century itself had a very big pandemic, the H1N1. It was also called the Spanish flu and there were 50 to 100 million deaths there. That's the number of deaths that had taken place at that time in 1918. Now, in the 21st century, we already have had three coronavirus infections. But the one that we are going through now, it has been declared as a pandemic. One that was there in 2002, again, SARS, the uh, SARS epidemic started from Guangdong with China. And a total of 8,422 cases were known the world over. But out of this, 916 died. So the fatality rate, the, the, the infection fatality rate was 10 to 11%. And the peak for this particular epidemic, we were not calling it pandemic, but epidemic was in May 2003. WHO declared the threat over by July 2003. Then we had this 2012, the MERS, the Middle East you know, Respiratory Syndrome virus there. And this was outbreak done in 2012. Again, about 2,094, 2,494 cases were known, but there were many more deaths. There were 862 deaths. So the fatality rate of that virus was 34.5, very, very high. 
and it was first reported, of course, in Saudi Arabia and spread near the Arabian Peninsula. Most infections were confined to the Saudi. The one that we are going through has been declared as the pandemic. Because the one million deaths are nearly happening. We have, we have come near to 950,000 uh, deaths, uh, maybe within a week or so you will touch this figure. But you can see that the fatality rate of this particular virus is rather low. It's le less than 3% there. The infectivity is very high, but the fatality is very low. So we don't have to really blame this virus too much. This is the virus that we are talking about. This is the scanning electron microscope picture of a cell from a patient uh, a severe case of COVID-19, heavily infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus particle. The virus particles are shown as yellow. And you know, this virus the it comes from the ancestral type O, but there are 11 subtypes that are already known, of which the most common, the most prevalent one is the A2A subtype, with the substitution at position 614, where this particle set becomes glycine. So D614G, makes it the A to A subtype, which is the most common, also common in India. It gives this virus the robust anchoring feature and ability to enter the host cell. And you know that it enters the cell through the AC2 receptor. The AC2 receptor facilitates the entry of this virus into the cell. Now, how did this virus come from? All of these three viruses, the SARS-CoV, we, we, we were calling at the time the SARS-CoV, but now we call it SARS-CoV-1. And the MERS-CoV in 2012 and the SARS-CoV-2, as we call the 2019 virus, they all have originated from bats. And they all need, needed an intermediary there. The intermediary for the SARS-CoV-1 was civets. And from there, it comes to the humans. And from uh, the MERS, of course, through camels and then here, and this one, we believe that it is the intermediaries, pangolins. It comes to the humans. And look at the messages that we get from here. The messages are, how do bats survive coronaviruses as both can coexist for long term? What is so special about the bats? Do the bats have a very unique and a super immune system? We don't know. But under stress, the balance between bats and the virus can get disrupted, causing the pathogen to multiply, mutate, and transmit to humans. And we know that it gets transmitted to humans through the droplet infection. But there have been a lot of theories that have been talked about, whether the virus uh, originated in the seafood market of Wuhan. Is it a natural virus or is it a man-made? Is it a biology? You know, is it a biological warfare? All kinds of those things have been talked about, but you know, the, there is no substantial evidence to support any of those. But this is very clear; it comes from bats. I took this dashboard from the John Hopkins University dashboard. It's fantastic. It gives you on one side the global cases. This is for today. The thirty million cases have become known of, of course, of which the most. Uh, numbers are in US followed by India and then Brazil and then you see all those numbers over there and then the deaths are on, the, on on the right side but you can see in this map here that the most of the infections are confined either to Europe or to North America Brazil uh, Peru uh, I mean um, you know country like Chile Argentina and, and Mexico here these are the numbers. But see, in Africa, the infection numbers are very low, except in South Africa there. And Indian subcontinent, of course, the numbers are growing. But when you look at the case fatality rate, this is very dramatic. That the number of deaths are very high in Europe, very high in, in Central America and South America, New York side and certain parts of the US where very few deaths in India, Indian subcontinent, and very few deaths in Africa. So you see that it also supports this hypothesis of microbial load and the hygiene hypothesis. The parts of the world where the microbial load has been very heavy, and that is, for example, Africa, the number of infections and the case fatality rate 
in those countries is rather low. This is also the case in India. Of course, our infection, the my, microbial load, the Indian subcontinent has gone through microbial load, and that is why we will talk about during the talk, uh, during this course of my talk that that there's a lot of things have happened due to the microbial load. But the hygiene hypothesis has played a very important role. You see, the northern Europe or the Scandinavian countries where the infections are very low and their all hygiene is very high, the autoimmunity in those countries is high, the infectious environment is low, and therefore the autoimmunity high. In Africa, autoimmunity is low because the infection rate is very high. In the Indian subcontinent, we have a double trouble. We have both the autoimmune diseases as well as this. As we are really moving towards the westernization and cleanliness and things of that sort, uh, we are now seeing the autoimmunity also being, being, being very high. So keep this in mind, the microbial load countries. This is just an observation, as you see from the dashboard of uh, either the WHO or the John Hopkins. Now, this slide summarizes what happens. How does it affect you? How, about, how does the COVID-19 affect you? It's a pandemic, as we said, is caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. That's why we call it SARS-CoV-2. And despite the widespread awareness of this, many are still unaware how it affects the body. This is the healthy state right in the top. This is what happens. The uh, alveoli of the lungs are surrounded by these capillaries, and there's a gaseous exchanges take place over there. That the carbon dioxide brought by these capillaries is sort of exchanged here, and the oxygen comes from the alveoli in, into the blood. This is what happens in the healthy state. And of course, in the alveoli, you have two types of cells the type 1 alveolar cell and the type 2 alveolar cell. We will talk about the type 2 alveolar cell a little bit more. But what happens in the people who get infected? Here is this particular uh, sort of channel where the infection has come through. The spike protein covering the coronavirus uh, bind the AC2 receptors. And the binding is primarily on the type 2 alveolar cells, allowing the virus to inject its RNA. The RNA then now hijacks the cell and therefore the infection starts and spreads. And now look at in the moderate case. This is a little moderate case, and that this could be asymptomatic or, or a pre-symptomatic case. In the moderate case now, after the infection, the type 2 cells start to release inflammatory signals. And these inflammatory signals lead to the accumulation of macrophage kind of cells there. You can see the macrophages there. The macrophages will now start to release cytokines. And there are a few cytokines that they release, of which the most common are the IL-6 and the interleukin-1 beta there. And you start to see also the accumulation of fluid in the alveoli. And this will anyway compromise the uh, gaseous exchanges that have to take place at the alveoli then. What happens then in the more severe case, there is accumulation of neutrophils. The neutrophils get re recruited to the site of infection and they release what we call the reactive oxygen species to destroy infected cells and that's why we need them. But they become too high and the type 1 and the type 2 alveoli cells ultimately get damaged, destroyed, leading to the collapse of the alveolus and causing what we call ARDS, the Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. And these are the people, the severe cases, the people who, who will then develop breathlessness. And uh, you can see that now the protein-rich fluid is all full over there and all. This is what you see when you look at the CAT scan of the lung of a very severe case. Now, these are the key phases of progression of the disease from a pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic stage where the SARS-CoV-2 infects the AC2 expressing nasal epithelial cells in the upper respiratory tract, as you can see here. Then you move towards the symptomatic stage or the early phase, which is called a milder phase. The virus now infects the AC2 expressing type 2 alveolar epithelial cells and the patients start to exhib exhibit pneumonitis. And you do start to see now the accumulation of 
or macrophages or some T cells over there. Now comes this severe phase, this severe disease, which involves, as you saw last slide, a disruption of the epithelial endothelial barrier, complement deposition and hyperinflammation there. And a lot of accumulation of neutrophils and a lot of cytokine will be released there, so much so that this barrier, uh, this gaseous exchanges get compromised. This is the late phase. This comes around day six, seven to 10. So this is the spectrum as we see asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic, symptomatic and late phase. And we will then talk about what happens to the immune system in each of these phases there. But this is another simple slide to tell you about the prognosis of COVID-19 infections. A simpler slide talks to you from day zero, go on to day 25. And the four categories that we talked about, no symptoms, mild or moderate symptoms, severe symptoms, and the very small number that goes to the critical phase, and in them, the mortality is very high. What happens is in the first five days, there is absolute, absolutely there are no symptoms. The virus has already entered, but there are no symptoms. The symptoms start something like day four to five, primarily on day five. And in the person with, uh, with, with there are no symptoms, the asymptomatic guy, he becomes immune. He raises a very strong, vibrant immune response. And he doesn't even know. And you have read in the newspapers many times, many people, uh, they come to know only after the test is done that they were corona positive. And there were no symptoms in them. Here in this case, again, there are no symptoms in the day one to five. And then there are mild to moderate symptoms from day five to maybe 10, those five days or so. And then these people uh, are the ones which are, which are home quarantined and they become immune and, and everything is hunky dory with them, no problems. Is this particular case is over here now, which these severe symptoms go on until about day nine or so, from day five to day nine or something, they need hospitalization because their oxygen saturation levels are going down and they may also be feeling a little more severer symptoms of the blood breathlessness and things of that sort. So in addition to the little fever and the cough over there, and most of them would also get cured and they become immune. They're the ones who need, who may need some oxygen support and all that. But here is this group over here, which will immediately need the ICU or the ventilatory support. And these are the ones, very few, some of them will become immune that, and, then they, and then they recover. And you have seen that a lot of people who were actually on ventilation, but they got cured and they came back. But the mortality in this people is high. So we are seeing about half of them who go on the, the ventilation who, who, who probably die. Now, let me show you this particular slide. This is remarkable. COVID-19 unprecedented growth in scientific inquiry. And look at the, in the PubMed until September 2. This is somebody has sent me this slide that he said, until 2nd September, from January until 2nd September, that means eight months. In eight months, in COVID-19, there are 47,000 papers in the literature there, which means about 5,875 papers per month. And compare this to the other a very important um, uh, event that took place in the turn of the 20th, uh, 21st century, the human genome. That many papers took about 20 years. So we were actually seeing about 196 papers per month. Look at the number of papers that are coming. A person like me who wants to really keep pace with the field of immunology, Find, is finding it very hard because nearly half of the of, of papers are in relation to COVID immunity or vaccines there. That's the interest. That's the international scientific cooperation that has gone around in the area of COVID-19 immunity and COVID-19 vaccines there. Now, I know that this is a mixed audience that I'm talking to. So I thought now I will switch gears and talk to you more about the immune system, the immune re response that gets mounted to the COVID-19 virus. And here I thought I'd show you a immune response stadium, a slide that I made way back in 1999 for our students there, teaching them uh, about 
immune response stadium but here like a t20 game you have 13 players on you know the 11 players all of you know uh, uh, to sort of play and then there are two batsmen there here we are talking of only three players so this is a pitch you have a batsman the batsman is the msc the major history compatibility complex the hla system this is so very defined in, as you grow in this species, I mean, many of you are zoologists actually. So as you look at the evolution of species, humans is the most evolved species and humans has the maximum diversity of MSC as, as we see. So MSC acts as the batsman, is, is expressed on the antigen presenting cells and the major job of the batsman is to hit the ball. And the ball here is the second half of player is the antigen. The antigen is very large. The pathogen is very large. It must be broken down to what we call peptides. So the MSC peptide complex formed. So the question here is no pathogen or peptides derived from the pathogen can be seen by the immune system unless it gets presented in association with the MSC. This is a requirement in the human system and in most of the mammals that the pathogen, the foreign exogenous antigens must be presented to the immune system in association with the MSC. And then you have the headquarter cell, the CD4 T cell, the CD4 T cell will then, it's a helper T cell, it will help the cytotoxic T lymphocytes or CD8 positive T cells on one hand and the B cells on the other, the B cells will turn into plasma cells and they will then make the antibodies. But that's in the simplest term, terms the uh, way the immune system works. But there are two arms to the immune system. One is the innate immunity, which is pre-existing and ready to attack. And the other is the adaptive immunity. Adaptive is what we learn, stimulated by exposure to microbe and it is more potent. Innate is pre-existing, you're born with it, you get it from your mother. And uh, pre-existing, ready to attack any pathogen, but it, it must go down and, and uh, the whole job has to be taken over by the adaptive immunity. But the other very important point is, since there are millions of pathogens that, you, that the human race gets surrounded by, the MSC or the HLS system also has to be very polymorphic. If the system was not polymorphic, it will not be able to present those peptides onto the T cells. And that is why populations where the microbial load is very high, you will see that the MSC diversity is also very high. And we have seen in the population, I mean, I might mention in passing and some of the studies that my colleagues did uh, in, in while, while I was still in Ames. And we de de described a number of novel alleles and unique haplotypes in the population of India. And same is the true, same is true of, of populations of Africa. And when I say novel alleles, that means they do not occur in the, in, in the Caucasians. So this is in brief the immunity or the immune response to any pathogen. And these B and cytotoxic T lymphocytes, we call them as immune warriors. Now, this is the innate and the adaptive immunity. This is in any textbook uh, picture there. The cells which take part, the microbes, they pass through the epithelial barriers. And these are the cells which sort of take part in the innate immunity, the dendritic cells, the phagocytes, and the mast cells there. And the most important cell is the NK cell, the natural killer cell there. Here is the adaptive immunity, which is what is the most potent one. It is stimulated by exposure to microbes. And it, it is subserved by T lymphocytes on one hand and the B lymphocytes on the other. And I'm sure my, many of you know all of the things, but the B lymphocytes turn into plasma cells making antibodies. And T lymphocytes, again, there are many sub, many other subsets of these T cells known. And I'm not going to details of those. And we call them Th1 cells, the Th2 cells, and um, based on their CD markers on their surface there. Now, what happens in COVID-19? This is a very important slide I want you to understand. This is before onset of symptoms. This is after onset of symptoms. Look at that. You take this sample from the nasopharynx or the virus from the respiratory tract. 
or from the bronchovalvular lavage is there. This is your day zero. This is the day when the symptoms come. However, the virus has already entered the body up to day minus five. So minus five, you have to count that the virus is already there, but the peak comes when the virus uh, the virus peak comes on the day when you get the first day of the symptoms. Actually, we are mostly counting as uh, the, the, the day, day, day one, one of the symptoms. And from day one, we go to day nine, and that at these five days, we call, call it total 14 days. And that's why you're saying you sort of go into quarantine for this. This is the peak of the virus. And then, of course, this goes down, which means that the test, the RT PCR test that we do must be done within the first four days of the appearance of symptoms. Because after that, a more, you, you could more likely get a false negative uh, test report as well because it depends on the uh, how you obtain the sample there are various factors over there but this is the best time to get the test done from the day one to maximum day four of the appearance of symptoms and then you look at these antibodies and i'm going to talk about these 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 even more the igm and the itg suffice here to say that the igm antibodies reach the peak at the start uh, in about day seven to ten or so and then they uh, peak up in about two weeks or so and then they go down and that's the time and also when the when the igg also takes over and igg is then sustained and that's the way the immune system will work but the other very important point i wanted to talk about is on this star here the viral load of sars and mers that we had earlier it peaks at day seven to ten after onset of symptoms. That's the difference between SARS-CoV-2 and the SARS-1 and MERS. The viral load peak was somewhere over here and not here. Here the virus has already entered, but you know, you, you could even do the test over here and you might find the, it, it is positive <laughs> there. So while that of the COVID-19 peaks at presentation similar to that of the influenza, this is the difference between the two coronaviruses there. So let me summarize some of the very important facts of COVID-19 immunity, and we will dwell on that one after the other. That there is an elevated inflammatory response that you, as you saw, the response to anti-inflammatory compounds is mixed. It varies from one individual to the other. Second is the most important component here, lymphocytopenia. COVID-19 disease is characterized by the decrease in number of lymphocytes. Not every virus infection goes through that. It, it, this is similar to HIV infection and AIDS or in hepatitis. Other infections, you would actually expect the lymphocyte number to go down, uh, to, to sort of go up because you want these cells to fight the infection. So unlike other infections, the lymphocyte number is down in COVID-19, similar to HIV infections. This is a very important uh, statement here. Patients who are able to recover this number by day 7 to 10 develop mild or moderate form of the disease and eventually recover. And you saw in, in, in that slide. But those with consistent lymphopenia, where the lymphopenia is sustained, they are the ones who develop a more severe disease, often going to the critical phase or fatality. T cell activation or T cell exhaustion or hyperfunction, everything goes in this disease. And we will talk, talk about this spectrum. That the immune spectrum is so very interesting here that you have some patients will have T cell activation, others show T cell exhaustion, others have hyperfunction. So, how does the lymphopenia? Relate to, relate to T cell function. We will talk about the temporal kinetics. Cytokine storm is something that a lot of people have heard for the first time in COVID-19, but of course cytokine storm we have known in the past and in a number of autoimmune diseases, we have known it also in the immunotherapy of cancer. This is like expression of an exaggerated immune response. Plasma plus, these cells, the plasmacytes, which will then ultimately make antibodies in uh, hospitalized patients, but they are still sick. So, uh, you know, the whole issue of convalescent plasma therapy there. 
the the question therefore is is there a typical immune response to covid 19 the answer is yes and no probably no more of no because it varies from one individual to the other and we will see that as well this is a very important paper which came up when we really these are this is from people who have all their life been working on oncology on immune oncology that's why this is from the memorial sloan kettering cancer center because they were surprised that the kind of immune response that we are seeing here in covid 19 is very similar to what they see following an immunotherapy of cancer so they were exploring the contributions of the innate and the adaptive immune systems to both the viral control as well as toxicity during covid 19 infections and compare that to also the uh, uh, situation in cancer let me show you this uh, what happens in covid 19 infection in covid 19 this is a case of innate immune hyperactivation and a case of adaptive immune dysregulation in the healthy state it should actually be the other way around what we are seeing in covid 19 the innate immunity which actually should go down after some time but it remains in the hyperactive activation state and whereas the adaptive immunity should take over and in a regulated phase it remains in the dysregulated phase and what happens here is that the innate immune immune hyperactivation is a cause for severe covid-19 infection in, in the patients who have severe covid-19 infection is due to the hyperactivation of innate immune system that this patient harbor an expanded population of circulating monocytes that secrete both interleukin 6 and il1 beta there that's the cytokine storm so an innate immune mediated cytokine storm the cytokine storm that we are seeing in them is actually mediated by the innate immunity you could actually remove some of these cytokines or particularly il6 by the use of this mono clonal antibodies the selizumab uh, and the seltoximab but this is not very easy and of course uh, the trials done uh, is not going to be that easy there because there are other issues that come up the case of adaptive immune response dysregulation the viral dissemination the dissemination and circulating viral rna in the peripheral blood is strongly linked to disease severity because once the adaptive immune response goes in a dysregulated phase there's a virus dissemination throughout the body there's a circulating viral rna and slowly this guy will turn into the severe form of disease hence an in intact adaptive immune response is actually the key to its clearance and to the viral suppression retention of virus specific memory t cells is indeed is needed for maintenance of long term antiviral immunity we have people have so far been only talking about the antibodies and the antibodies the way on neutralizing antibodies but the antibodies will actually go down in about 3 to 4 months time what you need is actually the virus specific memory t cells and we will talk about that as well that the the, the covid 19 virus generates these cells and these are very necessary for maintenance of long term antiviral immunity so how do we achieve that a few of possibilities are emerging let me first show you this particular slide which shows you the innate immune regulation of antiviral defense and tissue toxicity this slide has two parts this is the normal immune homeostasis when we talk of innate immunity we talk of dams and pants so the virus derived the virus is not directly picked up by the antigen epithelial cell it comes in the form of a uh, damaged associated molecular patterns or the pattern associated molecular patterns and that's what we call them dams and pants they are the ones which act, enter and they activate the re 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 resident macrophage cells and these macrophage cells um uh, then activate the innate immune pathways through either the tlr the toto like receptors or the inflammasomes activation of others and will lead to the secretion of these two cytokines these two cytokines are most important the il6 and the il1 beta and these lead lead to the recruitment of neutrophils as well what happens in the normal immune homeostasis there is also the recruitment of cd8 positive cytotoxic t cells and therefore everything 
remains in a normal state. On the other hand, if there's the acute lung injury, then the macrophages keep on secreting this cytokine, then they recruit more of neutrophils and the, the, the this particular uh, epithelium actually has the leakage that there's damage there, induces tissue damage, leading to alveolar flood, uh, flooding and, and fibrosis. And you saw that the fluid accumulating there. This is the comparison between the normal immune homeostasis and the acute lung injury. Now, look at the cytokine storm. And we have been talking about two cytokines so far, the IL-1 beta and the, uh, and the IL-6. There's so much a similarity between the cytokine release syndrome that we used to call CRS due to immunotherapy in cancer by the CAR T cells and the virus mediated cytokine release syndrome as we see in COVID 19. Here, as you can see, it's similar way the CAR T cell, the tumor, and the dams and pan, the macrophage will lead to the uh, cytokines, the IL 6 and IL 1 beta there. But these could actually be blocked without affecting the toxicity. So during CAR T cell driven cytokine release syndrome, blockage of macrophage derived, these two cytokines uh, limit the tissue toxicity without interfering with the anti tumor immunity. However, in COVID 19 or during viral infections, blockage of macrophage function may impair both innate and adaptive viral con con control. So earlier, when the, when the disease has started in about April or May, people were talking about why don't we use uh, monoclonal antibodies to block the IL-6 and that would help us. But it was found that it actually impairs, leads to impairment of both the innate and the adaptive viral control. Hence, that was then the, 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 the idea was then dropped. So this is the way the, the cytokine storm happens in the COVID-19 infection. Now, this is immune dysregulation that I'm talking about, that I talked to you about the innate and the adaptive immunity. And please follow this slide with me uh, one, one by one, because one is in the acute phase and the other is in the chronic phase. Now, during the acute phase of chronic infection, you can see this is the viral load. This yellow thing is the viral load. The red, of course, is the innate immunity. The innate immunity must come down and then it is taken by the adaptive immunity. The adaptive is the late adaptive immunity, cytotoxic T cells, helper T cells, the B cell, the antibodies, all of this you need. And then you need the long term protection through the memory T and B cells over there. This is our normal phenomenon. But this gets deranged in, in the chronic or the uncontrolled viral, viral infection that's in this severe state of infection here. So during chronic viral infection, persistent virus leads to T cell depletion. The T cell numbers go down or the T cells get exhausted. There's exhaustion leading to lymphopenia, leading to immunosuppression. But what is happening is that the virus is sustained. The virus numbers are not going down. So in the presence of large number, large quantity of the virus, or there's, there's exhaustion while triggering a, a, ongoing innate immune inflammation. The innate immunity doesn't go down. It remains in a state of hyperactivation. On the contrary, the adaptive immunity that we wanted to go up and get, get sustained actually goes down. This is the trouble with the moderate or the more severe cases of COVID-19 infection. How do we balance this act? balancing the innate and the adaptive immunity to combat the COVID-19 infection. And this slide, of course, gives all kinds of those things. I don't want to go into too much of details of that because it will otherwise become a very hardcore immunology talk. To improve anti-COVID immunity, it is necessary to either enhance the antiviral sensing, and the sensing has to be increased, or you enhance the adaptive immunity by rescuing the T cells from exhaustion, or you block the macrophages over there. These are the ways that you can do it. And then, of course, you can use all of those kinds of things have been used, are currently being used in hospitalized patients, antivirals or convalescent plasma or corticosteroids or the blockade for IL-1 or IL-C, all intended towards making sure that the innate immunity should go down 
and the adaptive immunity should come up. This is not happening. So using strategies to modulate innate and adaptive immune responses during early and late COVID-19 infection, this may lead to more effective viral con con control in fact. Now, this, this is actually the crux of what we are talking about immunity to COVID-19. So what is the use of T-cell counts and T-cell subset analysis? Is there a use for this? Uh, these are very, uh, and it now appears there's a very useful parameters that correlate with COVID-19 and disease severity. We said that there's a lymphopithenia. Rather than looking at the lymphocytes in general, however, the T-cell counts are preferred over the total lymphocyte counts because you want to know whether the lymphocyte, particularly the T-cells have gone down. And you can then look at the level of decrease which will predict the moderate to severe form of the disease. T-cell counts will also predict the outcome, whether this guy needs the ICU admission or treatment efficacy or viral clearance. And for the highest groups, the diesel subset analysis would be also very, very helpful. You want to look at the ratio between the CD4 and the CD8 cells, or the ratio of T-cell subsets combined with absolute neutrophil count. Uh, you know, both of these cells are more addictive of the severe disease because you saw that the neutrophil cell count actually increases where the lymph cell count goes down. I publish and I'm regularly publishing articles in Hindustan Times. I don't know if some of you have put up also seen, uh, you know, when the pandemic came up and uh, it was end of March, uh, my family was very insistent that why don't you now write for the common man. So I started writing my first paper. My first uh, article came by Hindustan Times, uh, April 1. And here I had discussed, can India be an outlier in the spread of COVID-19? And the hypothesis was the three factors for the observed low severity of infections in India. I had said at that time that the severity of infections in India is going to be low. And uh, of course, we know that only 6% need hospitalization and less than 5.5% need the ventilatory support and deaths. And, and the three hypotheses was broad-based immunity in the population of India due to the microbial load. We have had, we have been living in a very high microbial load. So we have raised uh, a large number of memory T cells with a broad-based immunity in us. If you, if you compare ourselves to the European counterparts, the environmental factors in the food habits, and a lot of our people who deal in nutrition, they say that the Indian food perhaps is very, very good and that uh, contains all those uh, reactive oxygen species and therefore they, you know, helps us uh, to maintain our immunity. And people have been taking what we call kara and all kinds of those things. But the third is very important, and I mentioned to you a little bit, the, the extensive diversity of HL in the Indian population because of that microbial load, and therefore the, the existence of several novel genes and unique haplotypes. This is an important contribution of the immune response genes. On the basis of this um, uh, uh, um, broad-based immunity, and the extensive diversity of HLA. I had predicted at that time that the severity will be low, unfortunately, yes. But we had also thought at that time that the infection rate will not be that high. But the infection rate of this virus is very high because it spreads through droplet infection from one human to the other. And the diversity of HLA, I don't want to go into details. I think we, we are already going a little late. Uh, you know, trying to show you that the the diversity of uh, HLA various genes. This is one of them, which is so very common in every population. You see that in Caucasians, there's only one subtype, the yellow component there. In the Jambians, it is three subtypes. Japanese, again, three subtypes. Look at in the Indians, you know, the diversity. This is what I mean by diversity. And by diversity, you also find this red one as something a new, a novel subtype, which you only see in the population of the Indian subcontinent. So the question that therefore comes, they could HLA diversity of Indians resist COVID-19 challenge? This is something that we need to find. Uh, I think studies are already underway. Many of the studies have been done in the West. I don't know whether studies have been done in India or not. But our, our hypothesis is based on these studies that we had done in the past where we showed the remarkable HLA diversity of the Indian population with several of those uh, genes, and there are a number of them. 
the divergence could be due to selective advantage mediated through varied pathogenic challenges that that, uh, that confront the population of India. So we need to do all these studies, the population specific care and the HLA interaction studies to sort of really define the role of HLA over there. I want to again tell you a little bit more what I have told you so far, uh, briefly talking about the immunopathology of COVID-19. This is one disease where we are seeing, as I showed you, lymphopenia, both the CD8 positive T cell number goes down, CDA4 T cell number goes down, B cells go down, natural killer cells go down. But there's also T cell activation. And look, look at those markers, particularly the CD69, CD38, CD44. These are the markers of activation, and therefore, a lot of cytokines, uh, uh, the T cell activation cytokines. But there's also, you saw, there's a lot of dysfunction, T cell exhaustion, and K cell exhaustion. Everything that you know in immunology, you see in COVID 19. And then there are abnormalities of the granulocytes and the monocytes. That whereas the eosinophil number and the basophil number and the monocyte number goes down, neutrophils go up in COVID 19. Increased production of cytokines, various cytokines, but the most important ones are the IL 1 beta, IL 6, and the IL 10. These are part of our cytokine storm. And same is the true of the IgG antibodies, the total and, and antibodies going up, and we need these neutralizing antibodies there. If you look at the mechanism of SARS-CoV-2 induced immunopathology and look into how does the depletion and exhaustion of lymphocyte takes place, there are all kinds of mechanisms known uh, whereby they're damaging even the spleen and the lymph node, the virus goes, ultimately damages the lymph node and spleen, the you know where they which house all those all these cells. There's also the T cell impaired and the dysfunction there. We talked about that if there's a lymphopenia, it will also lead to microbial infection. The infections will go up. And, the, the, and that is seen by the neutrophil numbers going up over there. We talked about the cytokine storm, and this, of course, uh, briefly summarizes how does the mechanism underlying this cytokine storm. And the one of the other ways is the ADE. And we have seen this in certain virus infections, the antibody-dependent enhancement. Here, the virus entry actually into the cell gets enhanced due to the antibodies there. So maybe somebody who's more interested in that could talk to me separately on this. So what are the clinical implications of SARS-CoV-2 induced immunopathology? One, of course, we've seen that the effect of lymphopenia and on my, my microbiota because the lymphocyte numbers, both the T cells and the NK cell numbers going down, so naturally the microbial infections will go up. And that's what happens in COVID-19. Severe, this is actually the microbial infections go up. And the effect of elevated cytokines, the cytokine storm, which is very high, leads to dysfunction of multiple organs. And the multiple organs that get damaged are the lung, the liver, the kidney, and the heart. All of them get damaged over there. One other question that a lot of people talk about, what happens to the asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infections? People who have the, who, who turned out to be positive in the test, but there are no symptoms. But what is the immunological and the clinical assessment of those. This is a nice study done by the Chinese group, but led by the Chinese guy who's in the University of Pennsylvania. Study on 37 asymptomatic in, individuals in Wanzhou district without any relevant clinical symptoms in the preceding 14 days and during hospitalization. This group had a significantly longer duration of viral shedding. This was a sort of revelation that the viral shedding in the asymptomatic group goes on and on, probably more than the symptomatic group. The virus-specific IgG, this is a large paper. I've only brought about the major points of this paper. The virus-specific IgG levels in the asymptomatic group were significantly lower. The IgG levels in the asymptomatic group is lower relative to the symptomatic group in the acute phase. Asymptomatics exhibited lower levels of 18 pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines, which therefore means that the asymptomatics have a weaker immune response to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And that is also evident from the fact that the longer duration of the viral shedding because the weaker immune 
response in these individuals. This is a brilliant paper which came up in Science you know, on September 4, 2020. Again, a UPenn study talking about the immunotypes and association with clinical severity. And the study was done on healthy donors, recovered donors, but a large number of the 125 COVID-19 patients which were hospitalized and severe, and the severity was said. And they used high dimensional flow cytometry, 27 parameters, 200 features, and the, they, they compared the high dimensional data then. This, is, this shows over here. But the summary of this paper is that these people were, particularly in the hospitalized group, they were able to identify three immunotypes, uh, the type of immune response in them. So the immune response varies even in these hospitalized individuals. Great immune heterogeneity in COVID-19. In one case, there's a highly activated CD4 in the CD8 positivity cells, and uh, there is an altered uh, uh, fo follicular habit. Uh, and cells as well. These are the most severe ones in them, and the severity is very high. In this, the severity is not that high over there, but the, but the CD4, the CD8 effectors are rather low. And the third one, where it is very, very low, the T cell uh, become in a low or a, or a hypo activated stage. So these are the three immunophenotypes that, that have been uh, defined in this study apparent good correlation between clinical features and treatment outcomes in the presence of specific immune cells. By the way, the mortality in each of them was almost similar. This is really remarkable. Now, this is going to be my almost last slide to tell you or summarize path to adaptive immunity. In acute phase, and the long-term phase. I want you to be a little more attentive on this slide. Uh, the acute phase is right here, and this is the long-term. What we need is either antibodies or a vaccine or something which can give us protection in the long run. And here we are looking at the B cell antibody response or the neutralizing antibody response, and we are looking at the um, B cell response as well. You see that the memory B cells formed and the IgM antibody starts to come up somewhere around day seven and goes into peak in, in about three to four weeks time. It is both the IgM and the IgA. At about the same time, or maybe by day 10, the IgG and antibody starts to come, but it reaches this peak or, or starts to go to peak from five weeks to seven weeks. Uh, that's the peak over there. And then it goes down. Of course, the IgM IgA antibody goes down. The IgG is the one that we are lo lo looking for because the neutralizing ability of this antibody and it sustains. But three, four months down the line, it actually goes off. So the question that everybody is asking: Once the IgG antibody goes down, am I more susceptible to reinfection? So the anamnestic uh, response, the recall response, either through a reinfection and the reinfection, you have not seen much. So far in COVID-19, one, one or two or maybe three individuals and that also in a mild state. Or you could do the vaccination with these people and then you can boost this immune response. But what is not talked about much is the T-cell, T-cell, the cellular response. And see that the CD4, CD8 T-cells are all there in the acute adaptive response phase. Right from the week one, they become the peak. They start to come up right uh, at the time, the, the in, in infection actually gets into the body, and then they remain in a sustained state. So this is the memory, the long-term memory state cells. You also have the long-term memory B cells as well. So nothing to worry about. The B cells memory cells, you don't need too many of them. Most of them are short-lived, but the memory B cells, which remain sustained, uh, is sort of small numbers would be here. So the take home messages from the this work or whatever I've talked to you so far is the following. These five things I want to talk about. You saw that the magnitude of the antibody and the T cell responses can be discordant among individuals and it is influenced by the disease severity. That uh, you know the asymptomatic stage to the more severe stage. Early decline in neutralizing antibodies, as you see, 
should not be a cause of concern. A lot of people feel it's a cause of concern. Antibody recall response is always there from a small pool of long-lived plasma cells. About one third of the recovered patients have antibodies with low anti-RBT type. And that we should be aware of. They have no antibodies. The question is that there's no single uh, common immune response to COVID-19 varies from one individual to the other. Induction of an anamnestic immune response, either reinfection or to vaccination, gen can generate high titers of neutralizing antibodies and sufficient CD4 T cells to give you long term protection. And then the whole issue of cross reactive immunity due to common cold for coronaviruses and of herd immunity. I don't want to go into details of that, that the cross reactive immunity to, to other coronaviruses. And herd immunity itself is a big chapter. But if somebody raises a question, I will be very happy to answer that. And my very last slide, everybody is waiting for a vaccine. Everybody wants a vaccine. But you, uh, I want them to see this slide, how long uh, it took to develop other notable vaccines. You can see polio took about seven years, measles about nine years, chickenpox took 34 years. Mumps is the only one which uh, in the short period of time, four years. HPV, 15 years, there are many other viruses, but there's no vaccine. HIV, we have been struggling, no, no vaccine so far. Dengue, no vaccine so far. Coronavirus, we don't know when everybody wants it, by the year end or by early, early year. We don't know because the average vaccine, as you can see, development has taken about 10.7 years. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, sir, for this informative talk, uh, starting from the general uh, aspects of the COVID-19 infection and uh, its uh, consequences to the in-depth uh, discussion on the molecular mechanisms and, uh, and particularly your general public writing in the uh, newspaper, uh, your prediction regarding the uh, future of the COVID-19 infection in India and how we Indians are fortunate enough in comparison to the Westerners, in having a broad uh, based immunity, environmental and the food habits of ours has uh, boosted us for better protection and our own uh, human lymphocyte antigen diversity uh, because of the microbial load helps us in uh, fighting this COVID-19 in much, much better way than the rest of the world. Thank you, sir, for your uh, uh, illustrative uh, lecture. It is always a pleasure to listen to you and to enrich ourselves. So uh, and I'll now take off some questions from our students, colleagues, and viewers. Uh, there is a question from Pratip Priyadarshan. He wants to know for he has to know for how long can antibodies be found after COVID-19 infection? Does the presence of these antibodies against COVID-19 yes, mean asking, a person is asking, It's a very good Yes, it's a very good question. He wants to know how long antibodies can be found after COVID-19 infection. You saw in that last slide that the antibody levels, uh, you know, the IgM, of course, go, go down early. Uh, the IgG, which is the neutralizing antibody, also goes down by about four months. After four months, you don't see those antibodies. They are in a very low titer state. But memory B cells are still there. If there's a reinfection, or at this stage, if you get uh, a, a sort of vaccine, if a vaccine becomes available, you will have a boost uh, to, to the immunity there. So both the T cell memory cells as well as the B memory cells are still there. And that is why one is not so far getting a reinfection. We, of course, we do have. You know, in medicine and science, you don't have everything left or right you you would do you, you would definitely say but one or two cases of reinfection but the reinfection was also to a different virus uh, when, when you look at the uh, 
uh, sequences of those that were related to difference out there and the milder infection in that. I see another question, Shrikant from Jana. Dr. Nisha Patro. Now, there is another question from Dr. Nisha Patro. She wants to know, are there any risk of long-term implications in the infected but recovered patients? Those who are once infected but recovered, and is there any long-term consequences on them? Yeah, this is another very, very important point. Actually, you know, COVID-19, uh, we, we call it the novel coronavirus. We're learning every day. It's only about eight or nine months. So now, yes, there, is, there are implications. There are post-COVID uh, implications there. You've seen a lot of people, even though they've recovered from the virus, they become negative. But they, they, they still continue to have those symptoms of, uh, of tiredness or the headache and things of that. So that's the post-COVID syndrome. And uh, the post-COVID symptoms generally are seen more in either people with more age, the aged people, with those with obesity, or those with uh, uh, with underlying comorbidity there. Uh, so some of those people do have. So, 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 much, so much so that the hospitals are now making post-COVID wards as well. So there is one question from Shubha Kangshi. She wants to know how the COVID-19 affect our complement system. Well, there are no studies done so far. Uh, I don't know if there is any any study that has looked into the effect of COVID-19 virus on the complement system. I would like to see that. I, I don't know. Uh, sir, there is one question from our colleague, Dr. Shikan. He wants to know when will India get its COVID-19 vaccine? Uh -huh. Keep your fingers crossed. We don't know. It's not just India. When will the world get its COVID-19 vaccine? Of course, there are 175 or maybe 118 uh, candidate vaccines under trial. Uh, more than 26 of them are in the phase three trial now. Uh, we call about five or six that are in the uh, front runner stage. Uh, um, you know, two from China and two from US and one from, you know, that, that Oxford vaccine there. India is also doing its own role. India, uh, you know, there are about seven candidate vaccines under trial. At least two of them are doing very, very well. They have already passed the phase one, two of the uh, trials and they will soon be entering the phase three trial over there. But we don't know. Now, when will the vaccine come? Anybody's guess. You do see all kinds of news items. Uh, Mr. Trump saying it will come in October because he has elections in, in November. Somebody says it will come by January. We don't know how, how are they saying. And as I told you that the average time takes is about 10 years. So, but the, the, the amount of the research that is going on for a vaccine in COVID-19 is really remarkable. I am sure that the vaccine would come, but the big issue is on the effectivity level of this vaccine. How effective yes, actually, is it? That is it. Actually, that is his, what his concern is. He wants to know by that time we get the vaccine in the market and the virus, which is the RNA virus, undergoes rapid mutation and the pathogenicity has changed. How will then our body react to it, the vaccine? Yeah, yeah. So those are those are very important issues. Actually, the most important issue is the safety. The effectivity is one of them. The safety, and you know, actually, I am giving a seminar tomorrow where uh, I talk about this thing. Developing a vaccine against COVID nineteen is the most pressing challenge of our time. Nobody wins the race until everybody wins. You know, uh, I mean, although we say the five or six are in the right, right, right in the forefront, but we don't know. Uh, uh, the, the issue is uh, we cannot compromise on safety. You saw that uh, the Oxford Zeneca, uh, as per the Zeneca vaccine, even if there was a one case where there was uh, an incidence of uh, transverse myelitis, uh, you know, the vaccine trial had to be stopped. And the data safety management board has to sit down and see that whether there is a there is a causality effect over there. Whether this particular symptom with this particular adverse event is due to the 
vaccine mm -hmm. or not. So as we go into the phase three trial, because the phase three trial is the largest trial, because there the numbers of people on which the trial is done, it's about 30,000 to 40,000 or even more. And uh, you need to follow up and you need to see. So the safety is the major issue. Hopefully, we are very hopeful uh, a vaccine would come. When will it come? Anybody's guess. Keep your fingers crossed. But until the vaccine comes, until the, biolog until the biological vaccine comes, please, please follow the social vaccine, the MHD. Face mask, hand wash, and social distancing. This is your social vaccine. We must follow this. After all, we have been able to control HIV infection as well through those social means, through those education and all that. We need to do a follow this three letter word of MHD uh, until the vaccine comes. Sir Pratit wants to know uh, uh, whether it is the antigenic drift or antigenic shift that is responsible for mutations in SARS-CoV-2. Oh, it's a it's a biology-based question. I would, I really don't know. I have not, I have not seen studies uh, done on those. You know, it just has not been my my actually field, so I I haven't dealt into that. But my hunch would be is more of antigenic drift. But you know. The, also a lot of uh, influence of the environmental factors there uh, in, in sort of mutations do happen in viruses the viruses are known to undergo mutations there and you already saw in my slide there are 11 subtypes known but the most common is the a2a uh, and the de 614g is the most common mutation uh, there, there would be other, others as well but you know the business end of the virus which actually gets anchored onto the uh, epithelial cells it, 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 it doesn't matter actually if there are a few mutations here and there he also wants to know sir there are some people who never who always say that they never catch COVID. what could be the mechanism behind that and are these people actually the asymptomatic covid patients also some people claim they never catch colds. If it is so, what underlying mechanisms? Yes, I, in the last slide, I talked to you about the cross-reactive immunity. You know, in, in addition to the coronaviruses that we talked about, uh, the COVID-19, uh, there are those mild, at least six coronaviruses are known, and they are known to cause common cold, very simple common cold. And these could also lead to generation of immunity, the cross reactive immunity. That's one of the factors that we think that some people don't get any infection because they do have the cross reactive immunity in them. Now, because they have the immunity in them, they don't catch cold. Uh, or if you if you would uh, if you would also have a shot, there are all those uh, common. Uh, called the flu virus, uh, the, the influenza uh, vaccine there, if you take that, that also would protect you from developing a common colds. Yeah. But the common cold coronaviruses are already known and there is a, a fair amount of cross activity. One of my papers, then my, my seventh paper in Hindustan Times is going to come up very soon in about a couple of days time. And there I dealt with that a, 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 a bit more. Thank you, sir, for nicely explaining to us regarding the uh, immune response in COVID-19. And, sir, I have a question, particularly uh, for the uh, non uh, asymptomatic patients. Uh, there is a, a viral setting is longer, and you said that their ICG level is lower. So, what will be the long term consequences in these patients? In they don't have Suppose this patient, they, they don't they don't have symptoms, but they also have certain comorbidity uh, like uh, factors like hypertension or diabetes or uh, autoimmune problem, but they are asymptomatic. There are certain uh, reports in even in our campus as well. So, what yeah. will be the long term consequences there? Yes, we don't know. I mean, you know, this, this is the problem. The point is that, as I said, there is no single 
uh, a state of with COVID-19, there's some people, you know, of course the data indicates people who are aged, people who have comorbidities, people who have immunosuppression due to one reason or the other, like for example, the transplanted people, people with diabetes, their, their immunity levels will be low. They will be more susceptible because they, they will not be able to raise those neutralizing antibodies and high titers. So, therefore, they, 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 so they need to be uh, at home or they may need, 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 need to be hospitalized. We have seen a lot of people uh, of this category that I talked about, they get hospitalized, but they're doing well. So what we did not know in April or May, I think to, down these months, a lot of understanding has been reached and we have been able to save more lives. You know, the managing the patient of COVID-19 in hospital is not the same as it's not the same now in September um, compared to what we had in April, May, because at that time there was no understanding. We were talking about hydroxychloroquine, we were talking about steroids, we were talking about antivirals, we were talking about HIV uh, drugs and all that. And now it is settling a bit more and each case is an individual case. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I think I have, we have taken all the questions from the audience. Thank you, sir, for this uh, nice discussion as well. It is always a pleasure to listen to you, discuss with you. It is always enriching, enlightening. Thank you very much for being with us. And we expect you to be more with us in the coming uh, time. After this corona goes up, then we want you to be physically present in our uh, campus. Now over to our conference chair, Professor Isan Kumar Patra, Vice Chancellor, to present his presidential address. Yes, Ishan. I think you are on mute. Ishan, you are on mute. Yes. Oscar, sir. Okay. Oscar, Professor Mera and participants uh, here. It was indeed a very wonderful lecture. I don't think I've got to say much on it because you touched upon everything that one should know. And uh, I have read all your uh, comments, uh, I mean, articles in uh, Hindustan Times. I have them in my uh, <laughs> computer, uh, sorry, my mobile itself in the WhatsApp. And then I've been reading them. And this lecture that you gave, uh, I mean, I you, you don't need anybody to say that it was excellent, but it was definitely very, very informative. And uh, people who uh, did not know anything about immunology, uh, immune system, will be able to now boost that I know how corona is happening and how it is being uh, taken care of. I'm so happy, sir, you accepted our request and you talked to people. And uh, there are many things that they were there in mind. You know, there are so many queries, like, for example, me and my family, the whole family is asymptomatic positive. So we had many, many questions in our mind. So after listening to you, we feel a little uh, okay, type, you know. But then uh, there are so many things that that, take, that that calls upon one thing, that people should be very careful in what you say at the end, the uh, MHD, because there will be many, many people, like I had no symptoms, nobody would have thought that I am positive. So people like me who have not tested and are positive are around us. And they may be setting as many uh, virus as you, uh, yeah. enough to uh, contaminate, I mean, infect a large number of people or population, large population. So this is alarming and this is eye opening to all. And uh, it's good that it follows a genetic uh, lecture on the genetics of COVID. That was also very informative and uh, uh, understandable to a larger population. And your lecture is really. Uh, helped us to understand COVID and COVID associated in immune uh, issues very clearly, very nicely. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting our request. And uh, as Luna said, we would definitely like to have you in person in our campus and many, many times your last visit for a Ravensa 150 lecture and your lecture we remember even now. And uh, thank you very much, sir. And we wish you a very healthy and safe uh, life. Thank you, sir. There'll be a formal uh, uh, 
some okay. vote of thanks, I, I believe. Think I there's think. some there's some unstable. Thank you, sir. On behalf of the organizing committee, I take my I take it my privilege to propose a formal vote of thanks to Professor N. K. Mehra, Department of Transplant Immunology and Immunogenetics, All India Institute of Medical Science, New Delhi. Thank you, sir, for sparing to for being with us in spite of your busy schedule. It was really a pleasure to have privilege to have you with us. And I am sure a lot of misconceptions towards the immune response post COVID nineteen have been cleared today. Thank you, sir. I would also like to thank all the audiences and viewers who, who, who for their support and active participation even on the eighth day of this webinar series. Uh, uh, hope you will be live with us in the coming three lecture, uh, coming lectures as well of this webinar series. Before we end, I would like to inform you all that tomorrow we have a lecture by Professor Ajay Parida, Director, Institute of Life Science, and he will be delivering uh, the lecture on scientific management of COVID-19 pandemic. The, the session will start uh, on day, that, that day 9th of our webinar series, 19th September, 4 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Thank you.